I am. Two words that spoke volumes. Two words that echoed the strains of Old Testament narratives, angering Jesus' opponents, but breathing life into his disciples. Seven bold, remarkable statements in the Gospel of John begin with these exact words, giving us profound insight into Jesus' identity and showing us how to truly find ours. Our cries of, I am empty, are met with, I am the bread of life. Our pleas of, I am lost, are countered with, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Two simple words addressing every one of our fears, doubts, and pain. I am. Well, if you are happy to be in the house of God this morning, but you still hate Time Change Sunday, would you say amen? Yeah, it's good to see so many of you that I normally see at the nine o'clock service here at Capitol Hills. Good to see you here in the 1045. Uh, it is good to see everybody. I've had a disturbing amount of you ask me if I had been fired uh, and the church was just trying to put me away quietly uh, since I have not preached here in the last four weeks. Uh, no, um, we just had a series that Pastor Brian, Pastor Curtis, and the campus pastors were gonna lead. Uh, let me assure you, if you guys ever fire me, I'm gonna leave loud, okay? Not quietly, you will know. Uh, but it is, it is, it's really good to be back with you. Um, all right, raise your hands this morning at all of our campuses. Raise your hands if you've ever had Grubhub or Uber Eats show up at your house and drop off food that you have not ordered. Raise your hand if that's ever happened. A handful of you, it's kind of awesome, isn't it? I mean, you can't send it back, right? It's already out, so you don't have any guilt about it, but you didn't pay for it. It's just like a free meal on somebody else. Uh, it's somebody you don't even know. You can nibble on it. You can throw it away. I'm always like, oh, what well, they order? And then you can just, you know, toss it. Um, true story. This happened one night to a man named Kevin Stonehouse. Grubhub rang his doorbell and dropped off some chicken tenders and cheese fries. At first, he was pleased, thinking, God loves me. Uh, but, that, but that was followed by three more orders within the next 10 minutes, all addressed to him. And they just kept coming. He could not figure out what was going on until he remembered that earlier he had seen his son, Mason, six years old, walking around the house with his phone. Apparently, Mason had gotten onto the Grubhub app and just started ordering whatever looked good to him. After the fifth order showed up, Kevin went looking for Mason and found him hiding under the bed. He said, son, what have you done? To which Mason said, I was hungry. I was hungry. Kevin started to explain why this was not okay when the doorbell rang and his son said, oh, that must be my pizza. And uh, uh, evidently he had put in a $439 pizza order. True story, all told, his son had ordered $1,500 worth of food. So Kevin and his wife packed out their freezers. They made emergency calls to all their neighbors to come and take whatever food they wanted. And then they immediately put new passcodes on their phones. Um, hunger, hunger can drive you to all kinds of bad decisions. Hunger, hunger they say is one of the worst feelings that a human being can experience. When you're hungry, one of the first things that happens is your mood changes. How many of you have a spouse or a roommate that is un? bearable when they are hangry. Raise your hand right now. Point at that person if they're in the room, all right? Yeah, you get hangry, it changes your moods. After a few days without food, you lose your ability to concentrate. Eventually, they say you have trouble sleeping, which is the worst part of the process because you can't even turn this hunger pang off. And then, of course, your muscles start breaking down and your immune system is compromised and then eventually your body just stops working. Well, see, I share that because the same thing is true spiritually. And today we're gonna see how Jesus satisfies the deep spiritual hunger that we all have. In fact, if I could be so bold this morning, the core, the core of many, if not most, of your spiritual problems is spiritual hunger. If we were to trace some of your worst choices that you've ever made in your life, some of your, your, your bad habits, your addictions, even some of your emotional dysfunctions like anxiety disorder or OCD. If we were to trace them back to their source, for a lot of them, not all of them, but for a lot of them, what you're going to find is a deep and unsatisfied spiritual hunger. John chapter six, if you got your Bibles this morning, open them up. 
whether that Bible is in your lap or on an app. Thank you, Pastor Rich at the downtown Durham campus for that line. Um, This this morning is the first of a seven-part series through Jesus' seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. You see, the Apostle John structures his gospel around seven times that Jesus labels himself with an I am claim. And the first of those occurs in John 6, 35, when Jesus claims, I am the bread of life. Now, as you're finding your place there in John 6, let me give you a little background here. I am was the name that God identified himself by when he first appeared to Moses in the burning bush. In that encounter, which took place several thousand years before John 6, God told Moses that Moses was supposed to lead Israel out of captivity. And Moses had responded to that encounter by saying, well, but who should I tell Israel is coming to deliver them? How do they know that you're gonna, you know, who is this? What is your name? You see, names in those days were a big deal. Somebody's name identified where they came from, identified what family they were a part of, what kind of person they were, what kind of resources they brought to the relationship. So Moses, in essence, it was basically your name was like your resume. So Moses, in essence, was asking, how can we be sure that you're gonna be able to keep your promise to us, God? What is your name? God's answer to Moses was simply, you tell them I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. That was an odd thing to say. You see, in Hebrew, just like in English, you would normally follow I am with some kind of adjective. I guess technically a predicate adjective. I am strong. I am victorious. But God left it as just I am. Meaning, I'm not like you, Moses. I don't come from anywhere. I don't have a beginning or an ending. I depend on no one. I am fully self-sufficient. And that means that whatever you need in this journey, whatever you lack in yourself, whatever Israel feels like they lack in themselves, I am. I am in Hebrew is Yahweh. Yahweh, that's how you say that. I am is Yahweh. Or if you use the Latin transliteration of it, which we do, Jehovah. Jehovah and Yahweh are the same word. And so from that point onward, whenever Israel had a need, God would invoke the name I am, the name Jehovah, Yahweh, and then he would attach to it whatever attribute met Israel's need in that particular moment. So when Israel was hungry and afraid, for example, they called God Jehovah Jireh, meaning I am your provider. In Exodus 14, when the Israelites were sick because they drunk from a poisoned well, God called himself Jehovah Rapha, meaning I am your healer. When they were afraid, God called himself Jehovah Shammah, which meant I am the God who is ever present with you. And that brings us to the gospel of John. You see, in the gospel of John, Jesus takes the name I am, and then he applies it to the seven greatest areas of human brokenness and need. Now make no mistake about it. In using this name, in invoking this name, Jesus is claiming to be God. And even further, he is claiming to be the God that we crave, the God who is the missing piece in our lives. He's identifying himself with the the one who was in the burning bush in the Old Testament. And he's also saying, I'm what you are looking for. I have whatever it is that you need. Like I said, the first of those I am claims here occurs in John 6, when Jesus says, verse 35, I am the bread of life. There is no more primal feeling of need than hunger and no more universal satisfaction to hunger than bread. A relationship with God through Jesus is to our souls what bread is to our bodies. To get our minds around what's going on in this chapter, we're gonna talk about a sign, a sandwich, a satisfaction, and a supper. You see a lot of food themes today, JD. Yep, I get the feeling that local restaurants are gonna be packed with summit people when this is over. Okay, so make sure to tip well. Uh, you know, don't you dare put down a summit Easter inviter car, by the way, with a t- uh, tip of at least 20%, preferably 25, okay? All right, first, let's look at a sign. Let's look at the sign. Jesus made this audacious claim right after performing one of his most famous miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, the only miracle that's recorded in all four gospels. In fact, the miracle was the setup for the claim. So let's just walk through this, this miracle together. Verse four, if you look at it in your Bible. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. This is an important detail that we're gonna come back to that this was during the time of the Passover. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him because he himself already knew what he was gonna do. He said this to test them. 
He wants to prove something to them. He wants them to see, to feel how utterly unable they are in themselves to meet this need that is right in front of them. So the first thing he does is he tests them. Hey, what are you gonna do to meet this need? Can you meet this need? Philip responds, verse seven, 200 denarii is not enough to buy food for these people. 200 denarii was about eight months wages. So Philip basically is being sarcastic. In essence, he's saying, this assignment is way beyond us. By the time Jesus, we raised enough money to buy all these people food, they'd all be dead. Then another one of the disciples speaks up, verse eight, Andrew, and he says, hey, well, I found a little boy here whose mama packed him a lunch of five loaves and two fish, otherwise known as a Hebrew happy meal. And he, this little boy says he's willing to share with us, but what is one piddly little happy meal among thousands of people? So now having sufficiently made his point, Jesus says, well, give them to me. Give these five, five loaves and two fish to me. And then Jesus prays over them. And then the disciples start to distribute them, which by the way, had to be a gutsy thing for those disciples to do, to take five loaves of bread and two f- small fish and start to try to feed a crowd of thousands. But as they do, the bread and the fish start multiplying and they can't give it away fast enough. And after everybody has eaten all they can eat, Jesus basically took a Hebrew happy meal and turned it to a golden corral, all you can eat buffet in the middle of the desert. And after they're done, they take up what's left and there are 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Now watch this, verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, the sign, they said, this is indeed the prophet, not a prophet, the prophet who has come into the world. Why did they react that way? What have they seen? What was it in this miracle that they recognized? Okay, follow me. Everybody then in that crowd knew the story that I'm about to tell you. During the Exodus, after God had appeared to Moses at the burning bush, when God delivered Israel from Egypt, as they were passing through the wilderness, Israel found themselves in a place without food, a desert place. So every morning, every week, except for the Sabbath, six mornings a week, God covered the ground with a little bread-like substance. The best I can describe it would be like a little Ritz crackers glazed in honey. Supposedly it was delicious. Every morning, every morning this covered the ground and the children of Israel didn't know what to call it. They'd never seen it before. So they called it manha, which in Hebrew literally meant, what is it? And this is what they ate every single day as they passed through the wilderness. You say, well, that sounds like a pretty boring diet. Well, like I said, supposedly it was delicious and I'm sure they got really creative with it. They made manna wafers, manna pudding, manna kati, manana bread, you name it, okay? (laughs) You're like, man, that's a lot of puns. Um, Okay, I'll stop, I promise. So here we are now, John 6, John 6, a couple thousand years later, and Israel, listen, is again under the thumb of an oppressor. This time it's not the Egyptians, like in Moses' day, this time it's the Romans. And so again, Israel is waiting for another deliverer who is similar to Moses, who can deliver them from the Romans, their generation from the Romans, like Moses delivered that generation from the Egyptians. And now here you got Jesus showing the same kind of miraculous power with the bread that Moses showed in the wilderness. And to top it all off, Jesus does this during the Passover. Remember that detail I pointed out at the beginning of verse four? John wants you to know this happens at the time of the Passover. The Passover was the feast that the Jews celebrated to mark the date that God had freed them from slavery to Egypt. So here you've got a new prophet providing a new manna and instituting a new Passover meal. And at the end, there are 12 baskets left over, which clearly represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Everybody knew exactly what those 12 baskets were pointing to. So they concluded quite logically, this is the prophet, the deliverer. This is the one we've been waiting for. Hence the statement, verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet, the prophet, not just a prophet, but the prophet. This is the deliverer that we have been waiting on. This is the Messiah. This is the Messiah. This is the one the whole Old Testament has been pointing to. But verse 15, watch this. Perceiving then, that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, to make him the new Moses, to make him the new deliverer, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. They understood the sign, but they also completely misunderstood it. They thought the point was Jesus' ability to put bread in their stomachs and to overthrow Rome. But that was not the point, at least not yet. Jesus' point was, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He says to them, see, you got got a deeper problem than Roman oppression. 
you got a deeper problem than an empty stomach, and that is your soul is starving. And just being delivered from your oppressors is not gonna fix that. And just getting food in your belly is not gonna fix that. Or just getting healing from your body is not gonna fix that. What you most need, what you crave, what you crave deep in the soul of who you are is a relationship with me. I am the bread of life. It's not that I'm gonna give you the bread of life. I am the bread of true life. You see, my guess this morning is that many of you may have come in here thinking that you need something from Jesus. A job, help with your marriage, help with your kids. Hey, maybe you want maybe you want to get pregnant. Maybe you need new friends. Maybe you need a community. Maybe you need a miracle in your health. And hear me, friend, Jesus is not insensitive to those needs as we see here in the story. He cares about your empty stomach. He fed these people. But what you most need is not the miracle itself. What you most need is the maker of those miracles. See, some of you think, well, if Jesus would just give me this, if he would just heal my body. Oh, if Jesus would just fix my marriage, if he would just do this or do that for me. But I'm telling you, there is nothing in creation that can satisfy the emptiness in your soul because what you crave is the creator himself. He is the bread of life. So the Jews understood the sign, but they also completely misunderstood it, which brings us to the sandwich. How does Jesus teach them the real meaning of what he has just done? Well, you know, you would expect the heading over the next verses to be, Jesus explains to the dull, dumb crowds the true meaning of the miracle. But if you look at the heading in your Bible, if you've got your Bible open, look at the heading over verse 16. That's not what it says, is it? There's a heading over verse 16. It says, Jesus walks on water. Instead of teaching them the meaning of the miracle he's just done, he does a seemingly random miracle. Here's how it breaks down. This is the sandwich. He sends the disciples, after, immediately after the 5,000 are fed, he sends the disciples on ahead of him across to a, a place called Capernaum. That's gonna be important here in a minute. And as they're going across the Sea of Galilee, a quite a big sea, they're experienced fishermen, right? So they're very familiar with this. They get into a storm which scares them out of their minds. They think they're gonna die. And then out in the middle of that storm, in the middle of the night, Jesus comes walkly, just, you know, comes out calmly, strutting across the water like it's no big deal. He climbs into the boat with them and immediately two things happen. First of all, the storm calms immediately, then verse 21. Secondly, immediately the boat goes to the place where they're going. Now, this to me is probably the coolest part of the miracle. The moment he steps into the boat, shazam, the storm ceases and now they're on the shore. The whole point of this ordeal, the whole point of this miracle had been to show them that he had power over whatever storm that threatened them. But now they're in Capernaum. Verse 16 tells us that's where Jesus had sent them. You see that in verse 16? Capernaum was the part of Palestine where a lot of Gentiles lived. Now follow this. It's where the ancient Gentile cities of Tyre and Sidon were. And Jesus does a couple of important things there. John does not record this next part of the story, but Matthew does in Matthew 14 and 15, if you wanna read it later. Matthew says that, that, that right after Jesus feeds the 5,000 and he walks on water, the first thing he does when he arrives in Capernaum after feeding the 5,000 is he heals a Canaanite woman's daughter. Canaanite means Gentile. To the Jews, she's one of the impure people. She's an outsider. She's an enemy of God. And when Jesus heals her daughter, nobody can believe it. The disciples are like, what are you doing healing a Gentile? At one point in the story, Jesus even calls her a dog, which I've always thought was one of the most un-PC things that Jesus ever said. Not the sort of thing that ends up on the highlight reel of the chosen, am I right? But in saying that, Jesus was not making a racial slur. He was giving an accurate assessment of her spiritual condition. She was separated from God. She was spiritually impure. But Jesus says, I'll heal anybody with faith. And then get this, immediately after that healing, Matthew says, Jesus repeats the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, except this time it's with only 4,000 people. It's a nearly identical scene. Jesus is teaching the masses in a remote valley. It's late in the day. He's got only a few loaves and some fish for food. And Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fish so that there's baskets full of leftovers. But in this second miracle, he does it with only 4,000 people, a lot of whom are Gentiles. And this time they only take up seven baskets of leftovers instead of 12, which makes you ask, I mean, only seven baskets this time? Are Jesus' superpowers wearing off? Are his batteries running low? 
No, that is not what is happening. During the first miracle of manna, watch this. During the first miracle of the manna, back when Moses was doing it, the book of Deuteronomy that records the miracle, um, the book of Deuteronomy says that Israel was surrounded by seven Canaanite nations. These seven baskets are for them. The seven baskets mean that Jesus is the bread of life for Gentiles too. So what we have here is a miracle sandwich. On either side of the sandwich, the pieces of bread, so to speak, are Jesus feeding a large multitude. The first one consists of Jews, the other of Gentiles. And in between these two nearly identical miracles are two other miracles, the meat of the sandwich, so to speak. And one of those is Jesus walking on water. And the second is him healing a Gentile woman's daughter. Do you see what's being taught? Follow me here. First, Jesus' point is not his ability to put physical bread in our stomachs or to overthrow whatever Rome is oppressing us. The point is that whatever need we face, whatever storm we are in, whether it, it, it seems, wherever it seems like the, the waves of life might overtake us, whether that is a storm in our marriage or a storm with our kids, or it is a storm of addiction that we cannot shake, Jesus can step into our sinking boat and he can bring us peace. It means that what we most need is not some kind of physical bread in our stomachs, even some kind of physical healing in our bodies. What we most need is him. He says, I am the bread of life. Again, maybe you come in here this morning looking for a miracle. I want you to come up as soon as the service is over and, and we're gonna lay hands on you and pray for that miracle together. But I am telling you what you most need, what you've always craved is a relationship with Jesus, the great I am, the maker of all miracles. The second thing this sandwich is teaching us is that Jesus came for everybody who would receive him. He didn't come just for the pure or for the church or for the morally upright. He came for those separated from God. He came for those separated from the church. He came for those across the sea from him. Whoever has faith, even people like this poor Canaanite woman, a spiritual dog, if you will, they can have Jesus if they want him. He came for as many, John says, as would receive him. To any who would receive him, he gave them the right, the power, the ability to become the children of God. Listen, you may think this morning that you are miles away from the profile of a Christian, miles away from Jesus. And maybe that's because you're several times divorced. Or maybe it's because you had an abortion or you had an affair. Or maybe it's because you're a failed father. Or maybe it's because you've been convicted of a crime. Or maybe you haven't been caught yet, but you know you're guilty of a crime. And maybe you got a secret that nobody knows about. One that you feel so ashamed of that you hide from everybody. And the bottom line is that you feel miles and miles and miles away from Jesus this morning. Maybe you're sitting at home watching this online because you couldn't even bring yourself to come into a church. You think I might burst into flames if I go in that place. I got good news for you this morning. Jesus has just shown up in your Capernaum with the same miraculous power to multiply bread in your life. He's a bread of life for you, right? He's come to your Capernaum looking for you. He had to walk across a raging sea to get to you. And all you gotta do like this Canaanite woman is you just have to receive him. Which brings us back to John 6. Number three, a satisfaction. A satisfaction. Tell you how you want to look spiritually. That just, that warms my soul. I don't know what it is. Now verse 35. Now, after the miracle sandwich, now Jesus actually gives them the explanation. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. Again, not I'll give you the bread of life or I'll give you a way to live that will feel like the bread of life, but I am the bread of life. Christianity is not a lifestyle. Christianity is not a new strategy for living. It's not a way to fix your family. It's not a religious thing to add to your life. It is a relationship with a person and nothing more. By the way, think with me for a moment about the absolute audacity of Jesus' statement. I'm the one you're looking for. You know, it's popular in some academic circles to write off Jesus as a provocative moral teacher, to write him off as a great revolutionary, moral revolutionary, a great prophet. But would you think about the sheer audacity of what Jesus is saying? I am. Now he's claiming the name of God. 
I am the bread of life. I mean, even if you're a scholar and you want to dispute, like, oh, was he really trying to claim the name of God? I've heard scholars do that. Just think about what he's claiming and bringing the bread of life. I'm what you crave. The early church, this is what they celebrated, the communion. They celebrated this concept. I'm what you crave, Jesus said. I'm what you've always craved. In verses 34 to 40, Jesus says, I, me, or my, 17 different times, I'm the bread of life. Unless you feast on me, he says, you will starve eternally. Unless you feast on my broken body, that's gonna be like bread to you. And if you don't do this, you're not gonna live and you're gonna always be miserable. Feast on me and you will live. Historically, there has never been anybody that egocentric who had more than a tiny group of lunatics around them. To quote C.S. Lewis here, if Jesus wasn't actually God, one of two things has to be true. Either he is the worst liar that ever emerged from the pit of hell, cruelly convincing people to worship and trust him, or, or he is a lunatic on the level of the man, C.S. Lewis says, who thinks he's a poached egg. In John 6, Jesus put himself at the center of history. He put himself at the center of the Bible. He put himself at the center of your existential crisis. He either is who he says he is or he is not. And if he is who he says he is, that means satisfaction for your deepest soul yearnings are in him. By the way, you ever wonder what that really means? You ever wonder what it means for Jesus to be the satisfaction of your soul? A lot of times Christians say things like, be satisfied in Jesus. Find happiness in Jesus. But you're sitting there thinking, what does that actually mean? Right? You think that. Don't look at me like that. I know that you think that. You're like, yeah. It just sounds, it can sound like a lot of spiritually mumbo jumbo. Doesn't it? Be satisfied in Jesus. Does that mean that you're just serenely religious all the time? Always humming God's songs, thinking pious thoughts. Is that what that means? No. Here's what it means. Being satisfied with Jesus means that you got the absolute assurance that you belong to him and he belongs to you. And you know that because of his promises in the gospel that you have received for yourself. And that knowledge, that relationship with him is so valuable to you that when you're successful in something, you find yourself rejoicing more in possessing him than you do in the success. And when you fail at something, you console yourself that knowing him is more important than the victory was anyway. Yeah, you can be disappointed when something doesn't work out like you want, right? When you don't get the job, when the relationship doesn't go anywhere, when the boyfriend breaks up with you, when you don't get into the school, when you fail to make the team, you lose the job. Yeah, you can be disappointed, but your soul is never truly devastated because you have him and he is more valuable than anything else life could give you and more secure than anything death could take away. And that is bread for your starving soul. Being satisfied with Jesus means the promise of his loving, guiding hand is like food to you when you find yourself in a barren wilderness and you don't know what to do. It means that when I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will not fear any evil because thou art with me. It means that when I'm worried, I have peace knowing that he is for me and has promised to hear my prayers and rescue me and work all things in my life together for good that not one strand of my life is out of place. That is the bread for my soul. It means that when I'm in pain or you're in pain, you've got this abiding joy that even as your body falls apart, you still belong to him and nothing can ever separate you from his love, not height or depth or principality or power and anything in all creation can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It means that when I look into the future, I'm not afraid because even though I don't know what the future holds, I know who holds it and I know he holds me. The blind hymn writer, Fanny Crosby said it this way, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. His constant presence, his unfailing promise is the bread that satisfies the hungry soul. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. That is what you feast on day by day. It's what I feast on when I get up in the morning. It's why I start my day with the Bible because I need to feast my soul on Jesus before I encounter all the hunger that's going on in the world. It's why my last thoughts in the evening are feasting upon him. It's why I need friends in my life speaking God's word and the gospel to me because my soul is starving and it's only filled up with the love of Jesus Christ. Which brings me finally to number four, a supper. Verse 53 So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. As he said these things, verse 52, 
The Jews disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's gross. Even some of Jesus' disciples stumbled at this. Verse 60, see it? When many of the disciples heard it, they're like, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to that? I'm not gonna podcast this one later. Jesus said something here that confused even his disciples. Huh. But with all this background, I think you're in a place to understand what he meant. Remember at the very beginning of this story, John explained that Jesus did this miracle on the eve of the Passover, remember? Jesus is presenting himself as the new Passover. He is saying, y'all, in some mysterious way, that Passover meal where the lamb was killed and his blood was sprinkled over your doorpost and you ate unleavened bread, that and the manna that appeared on the ground every morning as you walked out of Egypt and through the wilderness of the promised land, that all pointed to me. My blood is the real Passover blood and my body is the real manna that is broken to feed and sustain you. Do y'all know that you can't just eat raw wheat? You ever find yourself in a wheat field and you're hungry? Don't just grab a bunch of this and just feast on it to your, it'll make you sick, right? I mean, maybe a little bit of it's gonna be fine, but, but raw wheat would make you sick. For wheat to become bread, it has to go through a rather elaborate and quite violent process. First, the grains are cut like this. Then they're beaten, they're winnowed, they're ground down into flour, they're processed, and then they're baked. And only then will it rise into what we call bread. What does it mean for Jesus to be the bread of life? On the cross, Jesus was beaten, ground down and put through immense violence. And only then did he rise as our bread of life. And so on the eve of his crucifixion at another Passover meal, Jesus again repeated exactly what he said here in John six, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood in saying that he was setting the stage for what was about to happen over the next 36 hours. On the cross, he would become the bread of our forgiveness so that we would never have to feel the starvation pangs of condemnation again. On the cross, he would be beaten and winnowed so that he could become the cleansing for my sin so that we could be free of sin, stain, and shame so that even though our sins are like scarlet, he could make them as white as snow. That's the bread of forgiveness. On the cross, he would reconcile God to me so that I could feast on the bread of knowing that I'm never alone, not in any circumstance for any reason. That is the bread of his presence. On the cross, he would give me the power of new life, the power to start over, the power to break addiction, the power to build a life of beauty. Even when my sin had reduced it to a pile of ashes, that is the bread of the new creation. But see, to give me that kind of bread, he had to be crushed. He had to be ground down. Only then he could he be raised to new life, new life so that he could say to any and to all of us, if anybody hungers, let him come to me and eat. He that feasts upon me will never hunger and he that believes on me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. I'm what you've always craved. Researchers say, the three phrases that bring the most joy to humans are in this order. I love you. I forgive you. Dinner's ready. Isn't it awesome that in the gospel, Jesus says all three of them to us. I had the most remarkable experience last week. I got asked to be on a, uh, a TV talk show. It's on TBN, one of those large Christian networks. And I flew out to Dallas uh, to do the interview. Well, I was in the waiting area and I sat down at the table with a guy who was gonna go on the show right after me. Uh, never met him before, never heard of him. And uh, so before the show started, I just asked him what his story was. I was like, hey, you know, tell me, we were both about to be on the show. Tell me your story. He said, well, I'm a, a fairly new Christian and I've just written a book called Seven Lies That Will Ruin Your Life That Ruined Mine. He told me, he said, you see, up until a few years ago, I was a, I was a performer in the adult film industry. And yes, that means exactly what you think it means. Turns out he'd done quite well in that industry. A few years ago, he'd actually won performer of the year in that entire multi-billion dollar industry. He said, I was super successful. He said, but I was miserable. He said, my journey to Christ began several years ago when a, a girl I'd known for years, who's from right here in the Raleigh area, by the way, 
She said to me, Joshua, the gospel is that you are not defined by the worst thing that you've ever done. Just like we're not defined by the best thing we've ever done, we are defined by Jesus' love for us, nothing less and nothing more. He said, you know, just hearing her use my real name got my attention because in my profession, nobody uses real names anymore. In my industry, you have an acting name, a porn name. And he said, I don't really know how to explain it, but the combination of her calling my name, my real name, and then speaking the gospel over my soul in her voice, I heard the voice of my maker speak in my heart. You see, he said, I, I got into the porn industry, not through one dramatic act, not because I just decided one day, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I got into the porn industry as a captive, basically through one small bad decision at a time. He said, when I was in middle school, my, my dad just up and left my mom and me when it came out that he actually had another family that he had secretly started on the other side of town. And so when it came out that he had this other family with kids not that much different in age than me, he said, he chose them, not us. He left my mom and me and he never spoke to me again. Even though my dad was really well off, he refused to pay child support and somehow got away with it. He never paid child support to my mom and me. And I had to go to school because it was a small town. I had to go to school with his other kids and I would see them every day and they lived comfortably while my mom and I lived in abject poverty. He said, I felt worthless, unloved. And that's when I started to hear these voices in my heart, voices that told me that I was nothing more than the bad things that I had done, that nobody would ever truly love me, that I would never be a good father, that I would never be a good man, that I would never make anyone proud. And so I turned to the porn industry to try and satisfy a hunger deep in my heart. He said, for a while, it was intoxicating. But that day when that girl said my name, and spoke the gospel over me, my maker unlocked the chains that had shackled my heart. After a few months, he said, I came to Christ, and then I got discipled by some, some godly men, and now I go around the country speaking at men's conferences and in student ministries, warning them about the true nature of the porn industry, the predatory nature of the porn industry, and testifying to the power of the gospel. I sat there dumbfounded. I don't know how to explain this if you've never felt it, but I knew I was in the presence of the I am. God was just there, right there in the room with us. He said to me, so what's your story? I said, not that, not that. I was like, man, I sure am glad that I'm going on this show before you and not after you. He had a copy of his book there and I asked him if, if I was like, is this book basically your story? And he said something I thought was absolutely profound. Listen to this. He said, not really. He said, I mean, I use my story in it, obviously, some. He said, but I don't want to glorify my story. He said, what I did was a symptom of a hungry heart, a heart that every man I've ever known possesses. Most people will not express their hungry heart the way that I did or to the extent that I did. But all of them got the same hungry heart that I have. And so my book is more about the bread of life offered to all of us than the particulars of my specific story. If anybody hungers, let them come to Jesus and eat. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst, which brings us to the table, the supper. I want you to take out this little cup with the bread built in. Fun fact, these are exactly what Jesus used when he did this at the last supper. The disciples spent the greater part of the upper room discourse trying to figure out how to separate the bread from the cup. Just kidding. Hold this in your hand, but don't open it yet. Please don't open it yet. I'll get you to do that together here in a moment, okay? On the night that Jesus died, he repeated, listen, what he'd said here in John 6. Read it. This is my body, he said, broken for you. Eat my body, drink my blood. He did not mean that as we eat it, it transforms or transubstantiates as the word into his literal body and blood. Some Christians try to say that, but this was obviously a metaphor. Jesus used all kinds of metaphors in the gospel of John. I'm the vine, I'm the door. When he said I'm the vine, he didn't mean that leafy vegetable substances start growing in us. 
The disciples understood this as a metaphor. Think about it. When Jesus held out the bread and the cup to his disciples at the Last Supper, they didn't think they were literally eating his flesh. They didn't think that as they ate the bread and drank from the cup, that parts of his body were disappearing off of him and into them. Jesus was like, ow, Peter, don't chew so hard. No, the bread is a representation of the body of Jesus. And you and me eating it is a metaphor of us feasting on Jesus. To feast on him now, right now, right now. All you need are two things. Hunger, that's the first thing you need. It means you gotta know how much you need him. Remember I told you just before Jesus did this miracle, feeding the 5,000, he asked the disciples, why don't you feed them? He wanted them to feel the despair of inability. Maybe he's been testing you the same way this morning. Maybe you've just had this litany of failures and you come in this morning hungry and Jesus has been testing you. Hey, why don't you try it? Why don't you do this? Why don't you fix this? And you're like, I can't. And he's like, exactly. Every effective 12 step program in existence starts with recognizing that you are powerless. And they do that because it's only when you acknowledge that you can't do it, that you're then eligible for help from above. So if God is convicting you that you're a bad husband or a bad wife or a bad parent or an inconsistent friend or a prisoner of your addictions, it's because he wants to set you free. He tested you like Philip and Andrew. And he says, now you're ready? Are you ready to forsake your own power and feast on me? So you gotta have hunger. Second thing that you need is a willingness to come to him completely as Lord and Savior. This is not one meal that you add in among many. To feast upon him means to recognize and acknowledge that he is the God that your soul is created for. Now listen, only Christians are supposed to partake in this. Jesus said this was a special moment of communion between him and his followers. He said, if you, 1 Corinthians 11, if you partake of the bread and the cup when you're not his follower, it's like you're mocking him. And that's a rather serious blasphemy you don't wanna commit. So I would humbly ask you on his behalf, if you're not a fully surrendered follower of Jesus, please do not partake of the bread and the cup today. I don't mean if you struggle with sin that you shouldn't take it because we all do that. In fact, that's why we need this grace feast. What I mean is if you know that you're not Jesus' follower, you're not fully surrendered to him, then refrain from taking this bread and this cup. It'll be better for you if you don't take it. But please, listen, don't think I'm being judgmental or exclusive in saying that because what I can offer you right now is more important to you than this physical bread and cup, and that is the body and the blood that they represent. 2,000 years ago, this body was crushed for you, and his blood was spilt for you to give you the forgiveness of sin and eternal life if you will simply receive it. And maybe that's what you could do right now. Why don't you bow your heads, if you would, at all of our campuses, bow your heads. If you've never received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, if you've never received his restoration, right now, give yourself to him. Receive him as Lord and Savior. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. To those who believe on his name right now, say, Lord Jesus, I receive your forgiveness that you're offering. I receive you as Lord and Savior. I surrender. If you pray that just now at the end of the service, I want you to come up, take one of the hand of one of our pastors or prayer team and just tell them you made that decision. Father, I pray for those who just trusted in Jesus. Thank you for meeting them here. And God, as we open this bread in the cup, may you commune with us in a special way. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, if you would, I want you to take this, the bread in the cup. Open the bottom so that the bread comes out. On the night that Jesus died, he took bread he said, this is my body broken for you. It'll satisfy the deepest parts of your soul. It'll give you strength. It's my presence with you. He said, eat it. And as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood that is spilled for you. This is the new covenant of my blood. It's for your forgiveness. I want you to think about this often. 
because it is the assurance that you're never alone, that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, that I will never leave you or forsake you, and that there's nothing more that I will ever hold against you ever again for any reason. Take it, and as you do, remember me. Let me ask you, if you would, at all of our campuses, would you stand together and let's feast once again upon the bread of life, the great I am.